This podcast is sponsored by Bigger Brains, online training that won't bore you to tears. Expand the minds of your workforce at getbiggerbrains.com. Welcome to Permission to Speak, the video blog and podcast that loiters at the intersection of leaders who want their people to speak up, technology that facilitates connections, and results that serve our higher purpose. Now, here's your host, Kelly Vandiver. Hi, welcome to the podcast. This is Kelly Vandiver. My special guest today is Paul Smith. Paul spent 20 years in progressively higher levels of management at the Procter & Gamble Company, ultimately becoming the head of consumer research for a $6 billion global business. He spent many of of his corporate years studying the art and science of leadership and communication by interviewing hundreds of people from dozens of countries. Specifically, he was looking for profound moments of clarity in their careers and personal lives that bear repeating. He documented some of what he learned in his two books, the first book is Lead with a Story, a guide to crafting business narratives that capture, convince, and inspire. And a second book is Parenting with a Story, real life lessons and character for parents and children to share. He's currently working on his third book, Sell with a Story, how to capture attention, build trust, and close the sale. And we'll have to have you pack on, Paul, after that book comes out. Uh, I'd be happy to. (laughs) Paul's work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Inc. Magazine, Time, Forbes, the uh, Washington Post, and others. His keynote speaking and training clients have included Hewlett Packard, Ford, Bear Medical, Comcast Cable, Progressive, Walmart, Merrill Lynch, Kaiser Permanente, and of course, Procter & Gamble. Paul lives with his wife and two sons in the Cincinnati suburb of Mason, Ohio. Welcome again to the podcast, Paul. Well, thank you very much, Kelly. I'm glad to be here. Okay. So as you know, we start out with a couple of quirky questions mm-hmm. to let our audience get to know you a little better. So my first quirky question for you is, what is your favorite possession? Yeah, that was an interesting one. Uh, quirky and interesting. I could <laughs> probably give you a, a half a dozen different answers. But um, uh, after thinking about it and, and actually consulting with my wife over it, Kev, <laughs> Because she's she's got a better perspective on what it is. What do I spend most of my time with or fawn over the most? I suppose, other than my wife and kids, who I wouldn't consider a possession, I'd have to say it's my uh, book collection uh, and um, the the books that I have in the house. And and maybe it's being an author myself, or maybe it's just my passion for reading. In fact, it probably happened in that order. I probably developed a passion for reading, be- you know, before becoming an author. In fact, I'm certain I did. Um, but uh, until five or six years ago, every book that I owned it was a physical hard copy book, of course. And now you know, I, I mostly read on Kindle or ebook or something. Um, but I, I can't get rid of those old books. And the reason I can't get rid of them is because I, I read nonfiction almost exclusively. I, I rarely read a fiction book. And, um, and so I highlight, you know, parts of the book. I, I, I write notes in the margins. Um, I dog ear the the pages, and at the end, it, it is a a well loved book, <laughs> and with almost as much of my own ideas in it as the author's ideas, and so to throw that away, just I I couldn't bear doing it. And so I I have around my house, you know, several bookshelves, and um, uh, you know, f- more than full. Uh, you know, my wife would prefer for there to be more pictures and knickknacks and fewer fewer books, but I, I just can't bring myself to to get rid of any of them. So I, I, that probably is my, my most prized possession. Nice, nice. Now, I, I too, have both the hard copy and the, the Kindle. So when I read nonfiction on the Kindle, I, I kind of miss the the ability to write in the margins and I can do you add notes and stuff and highlight things when you're reading on your Kindle or yeah I do and that's that's an astute observation because that's the reason that it took me until you know four or five years ago to begin reading Kindle since it was available long before that is that lack of an ability to you you could highlight yes but you and and you can take notes but it's not in the margin (laughs) it's not on the page it's some little icon that says you have typed a note if you click here, you can read it. And it's just, it's not the same kinesthetic experience right. of paging through a book and seeing your handwriting on it. And so for a while, I, I literally, and uh, I, I would, uh, I'd buy a Kindle version of a book or an ebook, and I would convert it to a PDF and I would read the PDF because you can handwrite on the PDF. Oh, really? And that's what I would do. And then finally, I, I, I finally broke down and just said, <laughs> okay, I'm just going to go full ebook. 
And so now I type the notes and, and highlight the way they want me to, you know, and the benefit of that is I guess you get, it's more searchable. You can search right. for your own words that you've typed. So I definitely see the benefit, but it took me years to, to get rid of <laughs> being able to see my own highlights and my own notes in the margin of my own handwriting. And, uh, but I'd still count my books as my, I guess, my, my favorite possession. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. I could go on for ages yeah. about this because, you know, the kinesthetic, it's on that page. I remember it was on the right hand side, exactly. somewhere about midway through the book, you know. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So my <clears throat> second quirky question is tell us something surprising about yourself that most people don't know. Oh, yeah. You know, and it's probably just where I was born and raised. And, and that is in a small town in the state of Arkansas. And, uh, you know, if you know me well, you probably have heard me talk about that or you, you know that about me. But the reason why I think most people don't know it is that and, and maybe to you, I sound like a complete hayseed, but um, <laughs> I've lived so many places that my accent has gotten quite muddled. I and mean, I'm sure after the first 21 years of my life that I lived in Arkansas, I, I sounded very much like an Arkansan. But I've lived on the East Coast. I've lived on the West Coast. I've lived in the Pacific Northwest. I've lived in the Midwest. And for the last 27 years, so more years of my life, I've lived somewhere very different than in the South. And so I think my accent, it's hard to place now. Like it, it's, it's a, I think there's, if you get me talking to my family members on the phone, you'll definitely hear it come out. But I, that, that tends to surprise people when I, when I tell them that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Very cool. All righty. And now uh, a little deeper question. What is your story? What happened in your life as a leader that put you on the path of, of understanding or, or seeking out these stories and, and connecting those with your, with your people and, and with the others that you work with? Yeah, so, you know, maybe I'm a slow learner, but it probably took me 15 years at P&G for it to finally dawn on me that storytelling was an important component of leadership. And it finally dawned on me because I noticed that the leaders that I admired the most, that I that I wanted to work for, that I, I wanted to grow up and be like in, in the company, were great storytellers. And and then it occurred to me that, gosh, nobody ever taught me how to do that. You know, nobody ever taught me, not in business school, not at P&G when I got there. Um, you know, so it's something I, I set out to learn on on my own. Um, and that's what ended up turning into the book. But the 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 way it it came about, there were a couple of real pivotal moments to answer your question. One would have been in, in the year 2008, I read the book um, Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath. Love that one. Uh, phenomenal book. Yeah, you, you've clearly read it as well. Um, in fact, uh, I loved it so much I started incorporating much of the theory in that into some communications courses I was teaching at P&G. And eventually I, I contacted the, the authors and said, look, I, I think there's some commercial value in the combination of – uh, the the theory that's in your book and the practical real world application of it that that I find at my work and that I'm teaching in this class, and so so long story short, we ended up uh, I ended up becoming their first licensed trainer. So I would take a vacation day from P and G and go somewhere and spend a day or half a day with some companies executives and teach them, you know, made to stick, <clears throat> delivered by Paul Smith with my personal training course that I developed based on the book. And uh, eventually, uh, we decided, uh, to, to, well, we were doing that, but the, they also suggested, why don't we co-author a book together? And it would be essentially the follow-up to Made to Stick, like the, the practical guide to making your ideas stick or something. And it essentially would be the book version of the course that I was teaching. And I would write half of it, and they would write half of it. And so during the, the year 2009, I was doing both of those things, and just on my vacation time from P&G, and absolutely loving it. And and developed a real passion for both teaching and writing. And come the end of that year, uh, something very disappointing happened, or two very disappointing things happened. Um, one is they they decided that uh, you know I, I on my few vacation days from P and G am not able to deliver you know enough of these training courses to be successful in in their mind, and and I don't blame them for that. Um, you know I wasn't able to deliver uh, you know new clients that they didn't have, and if if I if I did, I wouldn't have been able to execute them because I only had so many vacation days a year and I'm supposed to spend most of that with my wife and kids, right? <laughs> um, and then secondly, they decided that the book wasn't going to work out because they were already writing their second book and their third book and, um, and, and what little I had done on the book already wasn't what they were expecting. And so essentially by the end of that year, I kind of got fired from the, my, my two favorite things that I was working on outside of my job. 
And uh, so that was in December of 2008. And so I spent about a month kind of moping around about that. <laughs> and then in January, I said, well, you know, uh, I'll just, I'll write my own book. I, I don't, I don't, you know, they're great guys and I appreciate everything they did for me, but I don't want to let that stop me from being successful. I'll write my own book. I'll do, I'll create my own training classes. I, you know, that, that, that's what I want to do with my life. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but uh, anyway, so that set me off on the idea to do it. And that's, that's what started me uh, working on and interviewing all these executives all over the world and working on the first book, uh, lead with the story. Um, the second pivotal point really came three years later after the, so I kept working at P and G cause I didn't know if this book was going to be successful or if I'd have a successful speaking or training career. And, um, so 2013, the first book had come out, it'd been out a few months. It was doing much better than I expected. Um, you know, at this point it's, I think it's in its eighth printing and it's in six or seven languages around the world. And I was already getting phone calls from, um, companies to come teach their executives. And so I, I mentally decided that, uh, there was enough success there that I could leave my job and, and pursue that full time. But I didn't really have the courage to do it um, <laughs> because you know, I was still too young for retirement and I got a couple of kids to get through college and, you know, the corporate paycheck and handcuffs and all that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and so quite literally, I, I, um, I wrote my father a letter, my 80 year old father, a letter and asked for his advice. And I thought he'd just write me back and tell me what to do, but he didn't. What he did was he told me a story, you know, how I ironic here. I was this yeah. author of storytelling <laughs> and my dad writes me a story. And what he said was, uh, he, he said, you, um, you know, son, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life when I was five years old. He said, um, you know, I wanted to be a singer, you know, like Frank Sinatra or Tony Bennett or. Uh, Sammy Davis Jr. You know, that was his his genre, right? And he said, you know, first day of first grade, the teacher asked any of us if we had any special talent. And he said, I raised my hand. And I said, I'm a singer. You know, despite the fact that he'd never sung in front of anybody other than his mom <laughs> in the kitchen. Um, and so, of course, what does she do? She asks him to stand up and sing a song, right? So he did. He said, I stood up in front of all my classmates and the teacher and I belted out my favorite song, you know, acapella right there. And he said, I nailed it. You know, I got <laughs> all the words, all the melody right. I was so proud. At the end of it, you know, I sat down, the students and the teacher stood up and they applauded me. And he said, that's the moment that I knew for sure that this is what I was destined to do with my life. And he went on to say in this letter, he said, unfortunately, that turned out not to be just the first time in my life I'd ever sang in front of an audience. It turned out to be the last time as well. He said, you know, life went on. You know, I grew up, I got a job, I met your mom, we got married, I had babies. Um, you know, but the truth is, I just never had the courage to pursue that career. And he said, there's not a day goes by in the last 75 years that I haven't thought about that and regretted that decision. And he said, you know, someday you're going to wake up, you're going to be 80 years old like me, and it's going to be too late. You know, and he, he closes this letter, I kid you, as if that weren't enough. He closes this letter with these words. He says, I'd love to see you achieve your dream. But that doesn't mean in your lifetime, son. That means in mine. And, oh, you know, <laughs> like he's like laid the gauntlet at my feet with his, you know, biological clock ticking um, to, to do something about this. And so that's all I needed. So literally two days later, I walked into my boss's office and I resigned from my 20 year career to do this for a living. And it's the best decision I ever made. And so that that was the second and probably more pivotal turning point yeah. for me. So. How proud is your dad of you now? Yeah, well, I, I hope very. So he's still around, so that's good. Yeah. So he's it's uh, three years later now, and um, I, and I, I think he's quite proud. Uh, you know, he's gotten to see two books come out already, and a, a, a third soon to come out. And 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 I haven't uh, folded up my tent and run back, you know, with my tail between my legs yet, which of course could happen at any minute, I suppose. But uh, so far, it's not. So I'm feeling great about it, very and I, I think he is as well. Very cool. Very cool. Well, um, so. I'm I'm curious about um, you had this you had you know kind of that uh, transition and thinking about some of the leaders that you admired and their ability to be great storytellers um, and then you started interviewing people did you did you start interviewing people specifically with the thought in mind of I'm going to write a book about this or was it a curiosity and trying to learn about storytelling or how, how did that happen? 
Well, so I, I started working on the book first um, and, uh, and ended up getting a, a literary agent and, and helped finding a publisher and all that kind of thing before I'd, I'd written the book. Because in, in nonfiction, that's really the way it works. You know, in fiction, you, you just go write the book and then hope somebody wants to publish it. In nonfiction, it works the other way around. You really develop the idea, then find a, a publisher and then go work on the book. And, and I'm glad that I did it in that order because – you know, uh, people that are professionals in the publishing business know a lot more about books than somebody that's never written one before. And so I was just going to write a book full of my own, not personal stories in that they're personal stories about me, but stories that I had either in things that had happened to me or I'd seen happen or happened to other people that I know, you know, in my 20 years of, of kicking around the professional world. Um, and, and when I presented that idea to my publisher, they said, that's good, but it's not great. <laughs> They said, if you really want a book that's that more people are going to be interested, you need to have stories from more than just one or two the one or two companies that you've worked at. Um, you need a, a much more of a diversity of of stories. So they're the ones that encouraged me to to go out and interview people all over the world. And so I, I spent the next couple of years doing that. Um, ended up with over a hundred for the the first book. People in 15 or 20 countries around the world and all manner of uh, companies and industries. And, and I never would have done that if they hadn't pushed me to do that. Um, and, and, I, and I think the book is much better for it. I, I'm, I'm much better as a, as a story consultant and communicator and author uh, and trainer as a result of it as well. So, um, uh, so it's, it really was that order. Gotcha. Got it. And the book is brilliant. I, I, just, Thank you. I just love the book. Um, I... I I've been. I was seeking. I was seeking a book on business storytelling that really um, could be of use to leaders and to mm -hmm. other people that that speak in, in in a business kind of context. And there's just nothing else out there like that like it that I've found that I think does such a great job of ad of addressing some of the how tos as well as giving people a reference so that they uh, if they really need a story about a certain kind of thing they can borrow from your your mm -hmm. book to help illustrate their point. Well, well, thank you. I'm, I'm very flattered. It's brilliant. I just love it. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so for the, uh, you had some role models that you saw telling stories and that, that made a, a difference um, in how you related to that leader as a, um, as a leader. But for the leaders out there that maybe this is a new kind of idea uh, what would you uh, what would you tell them about why the, this is a, a useful tool for leaders to use? Yeah, so th there are many, and I, I cover a lot of them in my book, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you my top five or six or something here. Um, first of all, storytelling is simple. Right? I mean, anybody can do it. You, you don't have to have a degree in journalism or English or an MBA or an engineering degree or anything to do it. A anybody can be a storyteller. Um, secondly, it, it's really timeless. I mean, we've... It's, it's the oldest form of communication known to mankind, right? We've been telling stories since we've been scribbling pictures on cave walls, right? Absolutely. Um, and, and so it's always worked and it, it, it always will. It, unlike management fads that, that come and go, storytelling really is the oldest form of influence and leadership that we have and, and for a reason. And, it will, and I think it always will be. Yeah. Um, third, it's demographic proof. Right. It, it works on old people. It works on young people. It works on little kids, you know, <laughs> adults, uh, new hires, CEOs. It doesn't matter. I, you know, in all of my work with, uh, with with companies, big and small and every different job function you can imagine and, and, and many different industries, I've yet to meet a demographic profile of, of person that is immune to the effects of a great story. Now, I, I know a lot of people that are immune to the effects of a lousy story, and I'm one of them, <laughs> and, and you might be too. But uh, but I've not met anybody that's really immune to the effects of a great story. Um, fourth, you know, stories are contagious. They they travel on their own through word of mouth. You, know, you tell a great story to and whoever you tell it to, they'll tell it to somebody and they'll tell it to somebody. Now that doesn't really happen with our our policy memos or our <laughs> emails, right? That, you know, un, un, unless it's just a really salacious one for some reason, you know. But it, normally the professional communication that we come out with does not get Get, get sent out by word of mouth by, by its own, but stories do. Um, uh, you know, fifth, uh, I, I think stories make things easier to remember. And there, there have been a number of studies that show this, that stories make facts either six times or 22 times more likely to be remembered if they're embedded in a story than if they're just given to people as a list. And, um, it, you know, depending on which of these studies you, you believe in, but you don't have to believe any of them. The, the truth is you can prove it to yourself 
you know, right here, right now. And that is that here, I've just given you a list of four or five or six things. And the truth is you and anybody listening to this, none of you are going to remember this list of six things tomorrow, right? Or the next day or a year, a week from now or a month from now or a year from now. But most of you will probably remember my dad's story of, uh, you know, wanting to be a singer as yeah. a kid and wanting yeah. me to show him, you know, that I've achieved my dreams before he dies, right? Um, and you'll remember it next week and next month and next year. You'll probably remember some of the facts of that story, but you won't remember any of the detail of the the list of six things that I just that I just yeah. gave you. Yeah. So. Yeah. Very brilliantly said. Um, <laughs> and and when it happens to you, you're you're like, Whoa. I had a, a client that called me up about um, who had seen me speak, and um, we were talking about doing a coaching session and. Uh, or two and um, she after we figured out that we could work together she said I remember you telling this story and as soon as I and, and as soon as I got off the phone with her I'm like when was that that conference and it was 21 months wow. earlier that Long she time still, ago. right and that, that she still remembered the, the details of the story yeah. so yeah um, it's amazing mm -hmm. uh, okay um, so what do you consider some of the biggest challenges and some of the most common mistakes that leaders make um, when thinking about storytelling? Yeah, so yeah, so let me make that two two questions: biggest challenge and then most common mistake. So, the biggest challenge I think in in storytelling for for business purposes is choosing the right story to tell. You know, a lot of people assume that. The what makes a great storyteller is their their physical performance. You know, their how do they does their voice project? Their hand gestures do they seem natural? Do they make eye contact? Do they stutter, stammer? And, and you know, I, I just don't think those things are very important. I mean, if you're an actor on stage, that's very important. Right. Or an actor in front of a, a television camera, a movie camera, of course, that's very important. But when human beings have conversations. They stutter, they stammer, they back up, they say things over again, they pause to reflect on what it is they're going to say next, and they talk over each other sometimes, <laughs> and uh, and that's the environment that stories actually get told in. You know, I, so I teach storytelling not so that people that are going to get on stage and give a TED talk can nail their performance. I mean, that you can certainly use storytelling for that, and it, and it is, but most people don't find themselves every day on a TED talk stage. Most people find themselves in the office with their right. coworkers. And that's where storytelling really shines. And so it's in normal conversations with people. And in normal conversations, people stutter and stammer and do all – so those things are okay with me. Um, in fact, I think they, they, they make your story more genuine and authentic. Choosing the right story to tell. So I would rather one of my clients tell the right story in a very unprofessional and unpracticed manner than tell the wrong story magnificently. Right? I mean, you're, if, if you tell the wrong story magnificently, your audience will never forgive you for wasting their time. Right. But if you tell right. the right story that is impactful to them, that will help them make a decision or lead them or inspire them, even if you butcher the ending or stutter and stammer or what, have a few ums and errs in there, they'll love you for it. Yeah. So, so that the biggest challenge is picking the right story, and and I give people advice, you know, in the book about how to do that. You know, you look for, uh, a, you choose your message. What is the message you right. want to deliver, and then think of a success, a failure, or a moment of clarity around that, um, that message. And there, in in one of those three things, you'll find a great story and develop that. So that's the biggest challenge is picking the story to tell. Um, the most common mistakes I see people make are simple and they're very, it's very easy to fix. And, and it's that um, they either apologize for or ask permission to tell a story. And you've seen this happen all the time. People are sitting in a conference room and there's a discussion going on and somebody interrupts and says, I I'm sorry, um, can I just tell a quick story? I promise it'll just take a minute. Now, what does that communicate to the audience about how much they value the story? What does that communicate to right. you? Not not much value, right? Yeah, it's not very yeah. important. If they're right. apologizing right. for it in advance and asking permission to tell it, clearly they don't think it's as important as what was going to be said anyway. And and if that's true, if you don't think it's as important as what was going to be said, then by all means, just skip the story and get back to the bullet points on slide number 72. Right. But if you do think it's, it's important, just tell it. In fact, I tell people, don't even tell your audience that you're going to tell a story. 
Like we're not a bunch of, of, of kindergartners. We don't need to be told, okay, gather around boys and girls. I'm going to tell you a story now. And, and people do that all the time. They go, okay, well, uh, so let me just tell you a story. And that's just not the right way to introduce a story. That, that makes people think that you're going to tell them some long, boring, irrelevant, run-on story about the barbecue you had this weekend. I mean, leaders don't ask permission to lead. They just lead. Storytellers don't ask permission to tell their stories. They don't apologize for it. And they don't even tell somebody, I'm going to tell you a story. I mean, uh, do leaders tell you, okay, listen up, because I'm going to lead now. I'm going <laughs> I'm to give you leadership right now. This is leadership coming at you. Like, you don't do that. You just lead, right? So just tell your story without any of the hemming and hawing at the beginning and announcing that you're going to tell a story. Good, good. Great advice. Awesome. Um, so you tell um, in the in the book about a, a leader named Jamie who uh, really didn't who, who kept his personal life and his business life separate, and that's not an uncommon thing for for right. leaders to do. But then um, somebody in his workplace challenged him to tell a story, <laughs> and he told a very personal, uh, a deep story, um, and it and it really changed the dynamics of his relationship with his um, employees for the better. Mm -hmm. um, and you also in, in the book encourage people to tell stories about their failures um, mm -hmm. when things didn't go well. Um, what would you say to that leader that is hearing that and thinking, "I am not going to tell them about wow. how I made a mistake, or I'm <laughs> not going to get personal with folks about you yeah. know, my life." Um, what would you what would you tell them to to help them reconsider? Yeah, I would tell them they're missing an enor two enormous opportunities to build a relationship with their team and make themselves a more effective leader because those are two of the most effective ways to do it. You know, you like Jamie's very personal story about his brother committing suicide. You know, was a way to build a relationship, and and the reason is, you know, there's this fascinating study done in the New York Times back in the late '90s. And it asked this very interesting question. It asked, what percent of people uh, in the world are uh, trustworthy? And, and then it asked the question a, a slightly different way. What percent of people that you know personally are trustworthy? And the answer for the first question, how many, what percent of people in the whole world are trustworthy, was like 30 or 40%. You know, so it's one of those strange things where according to the average person, you know, look to your left, look to your right, one of the three <laughs> of you is trustworthy and the other two are not. Right. Um, but – once you ask them of the people you know personally, the number shoots up to 70 or 80%. And that's not an accident. Uh, and, and the reason is because there's something about us that we inherently default to not trusting people that we don't know, but we naturally default to trusting people that we do know until they give us a reason not to. Right, right. And so one way to get people to trust you is, you know, work with them, you know, for six or nine months and give them, you know, good reason to trust you. Or another way is just let them get to know you <laughs> and don't, don't screw it up. Yeah. And the second way is much faster because the way you let people get to know you is tell them a personal story about you and they feel like they know you personally. And it like magically moves you from the 30% to the 70%. Now you have to not mess that up with right. your behavior later, but it instantly earns you the trust that somebody they know earns with them that, that they naturally get. And so, but you, but people don't feel like they know you unless they know something personal about you. You have to be vulnerable with them for, for a moment and telling that story allowed Jamie to do that. The, uh, the failure stories accomplish something different and it's, you know, what, what person does not want to work for a boss who is more concerned about the, their employees' development than they are their own ego. I mean, we all we we want to work for that boss that's more that that's not con, that's not concerned about themselves, but is more concerned about us, right? And and so when that boss tells us, look, here are the three biggest mistakes I made in my career. First one almost got me fired. And here's what that was. And here's the second one. And here's the you know. Now there's three things that I can avoid doing <laughs> in my <laughs> career that I'm I might naturally end up doing those if I didn't know better. And now I know to not do those. And this person, he or she has really helped me in my career by admitting their own mistakes. That's the boss I want to work for. And if you're not doing those two things, then the truth is you're probably not, you're certainly not the best boss you can be. And you might not even be that great of a boss, but you're <laughs> certainly not the best one you can be. Yeah. By, by, by avoiding those two things, those are two of the easiest tools to build your relationship and trust with your team 
and to be a, a good leader that they want to work for. Absolutely. And I think there's examples of that through uh, media and stuff like that. You, mm-hmm. you hear people's stories and you feel like you've gotten to know them. Or right. if you listen to a speaker and they tell a personal story, you feel like you're getting to know them. So great, great advice, great advice. Um, so how, how have you applied what you've learned? Um, as you were in your leadership role and, and you, you noticed that the leaders you admired were doing this, mm-hmm. how, how, did you, how did you implement that? How did you um, use stories to help you as a leader? Yeah, well, uh, well, first of all, I started noticing stories more. You know, I, I think a lot of people, unless you're attuned to listening for them, somebody tells a story and you just, you, you might just ignore it. Um, or, you know, if you're, if you're in a, a college class taking notes and the professor stops lecturing and just starts to give you an anecdote or an example or tell you a story, you know, you put your pencil down, you know, well, th- this is just a story. This is not going to be on the test. Right. You know, you, 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 it's not that you ignore them, but you stop, you stop taking note of it. I, I would argue that the story is probably more important to you and, my, and will help you remember the lesson better, but you stop thinking that it's important. Um, and I think the same thing happens uh, in, in, in the business world. You know, I stopped doing that and I started realizing, wait, that story they're telling right now, that's important. Mm. And, I, and I literally, I would go to uh, conferences and, and big uh, team meetings and everybody else is like madly taking notes when the, the ch- slide changes and there are three more bullet points to write down. And then during the story in between the slides, they would put their pencils down. That's when I would pick mine up mm. and I would start to take notes on the story. And then I would put my pencil down when they got to the next slide because I can ask them to send me the slides. Right. But they can't send me the stories. So I just – I consciously started to become more of a student uh, of storytelling and, a, and a noticing stories and capturing stories because I realized I can't tell stories if I don't have any stories to tell. Mm-hmm. So it started with me just paying attention to and noticing and, and writing down stories when I, when I heard them or when something happened noteworthy that would make for a great story. And then I started sharing – after that, I started sharing these stories more. Um, and I think that, that made me a better leader. But it started with me having to notice them and capture them and remember them. Very okay. good. Very good. Now, can you think of examples of either yourself or, um, or one of your clients that you've worked with where a story was just like, you know, made that impact or, or really moved the needle for whatever they were trying to accomplish? Or you well, I, I, I mean uh, – well, every one of them that I put in the book met that criteria, <laughs> you know, because I, <laughs> I mean, I literally, I interviewed over a hundred people for each book, I, I, you know, and these are not like, uh, sending a survey to somebody. This is one-on-one like you and I are doing right now for two hours, you know, and, and in each of these two hour interviews with 250 or 300 people around the world, you know, I would document eight or 10 or 12 stories. So you do the math on that. Literally I've documented 2000 stories. And only the, the best 115 made it into my first book, you know, and only the best 101 made it into the second book, you know, so, and I chose them because they were the most effective stories. So, you know, I, I chose stories that, that were that effect. And I asked them, I said, which of these stories really was the most effective for you? So, you know, you could pick any of them. I mean, the story that I just told you about my dad, I mean, I, I've shared that story a lot and I, I get people that, that, uh, you know, they've either read that story in my second book or they, um, they were in the audience when I shared it with them or the people that I used to work with at P&G that I've told that story to. And, and literally they've, they've since done the same thing that I did. They've left to go pursue their dreams and they've called me later and said, I just want you to know that I quit yesterday. And the reason was because of the wow. story you told me about your dad. I mean, wow. you know, so uh, all of them are chosen because they've been effective to somebody at influencing somebody in, in some significant way. So when you're talking about all these different stories, um, and, and if, if I'm putting myself in the shoes of a leader that might be listening to this, um, how do you keep track of it all? How do you keep track of, of whether it's your own stories or the stories of others that you've heard so that you can you know, do something with them later? Right. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I, I think um, the short answer is we need to database our stories. I mean, if you think about just about every – meaningful piece of information in any modern business is in some computer database somewhere. You know, your sales and inventory and production schedules, your accounts receivable, your client list, you know, you know, payroll, everything is, is databased except 
for I think the richest source of wisdom in a company and that is its stories and those things are just in people's heads right. and people's heads people you can forget them people retire they quit you know so they leave and so they're at serious risk of never being captured in fact most of them are never captured so I advocate you know write your stories down capture them you know I and, and I capture them in in not like a full written out form but in in kind of bullet point form because I believe that you ought to tell stories in a more extemporaneous fashion. And if you, if you script your stories out word for word, you kind of encourage yourself to memorize it word for word, and then you deliver it word for word, and it sounds memorized and scripted. So the best way to not have your stories sound memorized and scripted is don't memorize and script them. Mm -hmm. And the best way to not memorize and script them is to never write them down in word for word, right? So I, I just keep bullet points. But I have a a database of stories, you know, now, now mine, I ended up having to write them out in full for the, for the book. So I have them that way. But what I advocate for most people is have one file, whether it's an Evernote file or a Microsoft Word file or whatever, wherever you take notes and put them all in one file so that you can search them by name or topic or, or lesson or whatever um, so that you can remember the story when you need to, to tell it. So keep your own database of stories is, is the short answer. Now, there, there are more sophisticated ways to do that. There are um, online uh, database, story database solutions. There are video story database solutions that you can, you can pay for and some are e even free. Um, and, and those are, are even more helpful if you want to see yourself practicing telling these stories. And, and the salespeople find that most effective because they've got to present these stories a lot. Gotcha. Um, but the, the simplest solution is the free one of just, you know, write them down. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Okay. So, um, so on this journey uh, with stories, learning from others and, and experiencing yourself, what have been some of the pleasant surprises that you've encountered along the way? Mm. Yeah, well, the, the first one has to just be the, the success of my first book. I, I, I you know, had no idea what to expect. You know, I, I, I've been told that most nonfiction books uh, sell, in fact, 90% of nonfiction books, I'm told, in the U.S. sell less than 10,000 copies ever in the history of their, you know, you know five or six year life cycle of a book. Um, and on average, the average nonfiction book sells about 100 copies, you know. So the average nonfiction author basically sells their books to their family and friends. And that's it. <laughs> I mean, right. you know, and it's because, you know, today it's so easy to self-publish. Anybody can, you know, publish anything they want. And there are literally 10, there's over 10,000 business books published a year. A year. Yeah. You know, more than 1,000 yeah. a month just in the business genre within the nonfiction genre in this one country. And, and most of them never sell more than a hundred copies, you know? So, um, so I was just phenomenally surprised at, at the, the success of the book. And, and, and of course, if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't be doing this for a living today. It would still be a hobby that I would, you know, or maybe a hobby that I had abandoned, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, at best I'd hoped that it would be a hobby that I would be able to continue doing, but it's worked out better than my expectations. And I've been able to do this for a living. So that's the biggest surprise and the, clearly the most pleasant surprise. Uh, the second one, though, might be just getting to meet so many really interesting people around the world as part of the process of, of doing the research for these books. Like I said, 250 or 300 people, many of whom I didn't know before and certainly didn't know as well as I do now, um, even if I they, they were a colleague of mine in, in some way. Um, but, you know, you spend a couple hours on the phone with somebody or in person with them or on Skype like this. And you're asking them the most intimate of questions about them, you know, especially for my second book, which is much more personal. What are the, you know, most meaningful life lessons you've ever learned or the most the moments of clarity in your life where you learn just an incredible life changing, you know, lesson? You're going to get to know people really well. And and uh, and that was just humbling mm. to to be able to for people to be that open with me. Um, you know, it's all, in fact, many of them said after it's over, they feel like they should pay me as if I was some kind of a psychotherapist <laughs> because they just, you know, they got to emote and, and get things off their chest and share things that some of, some of which they'd never shared before. Mm. Uh, but that's just such an honor to have someone, have hundreds of people be willing to open up to you like that and get to know them on that, that level. And that I, I didn't expect, I knew I was going to ask people these things, but I didn't know that they were going to open up that much. And I didn't know how much that would impact me emotionally to 
um, to be able to bond with people like that. And so that's been a very pleasant surprise. Very cool. Very cool. So if, if you didn't know all of these people beforehand, how did how did you figure out who to interview, especially if they're strangers and you're asking right. these personal questions? Yeah, well, you, you know, you start with who you know. So I definitely started with, you know, uh, you know, friends and colleagues and you know, started with my my virtual Rolodex. It is now probably LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and you'd be surprised at how many people, you know, once you're in your, you know, now my late forties, um, you know, a lot of people when you get to this point in life and, and, you know, a lot of the people that you've, uh, grew up with or, uh, you know, went to business school with or started your career with are now, um, you know, CEOs of some company somewhere or doing something very, you know, amazing or successful somewhere else. So, um, if you went back and looked through your Rolodex of, of people, you, you might be shocked at, how many, what they, where they are today and what they're doing. So I started with people I know, but the, the last question I asked everybody was now that you know the kind of thing I'm looking for, the kind of stories I'm searching for, who do you think I should talk to? Mm. And everybody had an answer. Oh, you got to talk to my cousin, Joe, or, oh, my last boss, you know, Barbara, or, oh, you got to talk to so-and-so. And and that would lead me somewhere. And then I would ask those people the same questions and so it's kind of a six degrees from Kevin Bacon kind of thing. You know, you end up <laughs> talking to, you know, I sometimes I ended up circling around to somebody that I actually knew. Oh, I, I, I know you already, you know. Um, but start with friends and ask that very important question at the end and you'd be amazed where you get. Very cool. Very cool. Well, uh, Kevin, before we sign off, are, is there anything else about business and stories <laughs> that, uh, that, you, that we haven't touched on but you think would be good for leaders to know as, as they um, go on this journey? Yeah, you know, one one thing is that most people, I think, assume that storytelling is this natural gift that some people have and some people don't. You know, like uh, being an artist or a musician. You know, uh, they just assume you're either born with it or don't have it. And 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 storytelling is not like that. In fact, I don't believe that art and music are like that either. I mean, I I definitely believe there are some people are born with some natural gifts. Uh, and like, for example, I am not a natural born artist or musician at all, but I'll bet if I really wanted to learn to play the guitar, I bet I could, I could, I could probably spend six months taking guitar lessons and I'd learn to strum out a few songs. Now I'm never going to fill Carnegie hall with people wanting to listen to me play the guitar, but I could learn how to get by with it. Right. And storytelling is the same way. There are some people that are natural born storytellers and some people that are not, but if you want to get good at it. And if you're a leader, you should, mm -hmm. you need to study it. And, and since there aren't a lot of, you know, I, that's why I do what I do for a living. I teach people how to do that. There are not a lot of places to go do that. There, right. you know, there are some places in colleges and the arts department, you know, especially in where they're teaching either journalism or, um, or creative writing or whatever that you can do that, uh, in the business world, there's not a lot. So you, you read a, a book like, like mine, or you go to a class or something, and then you you put it into practice. You practice it over and over again. So don't be daunted by this, gosh, I wish I was good at that, but I'm not. So I'm just going to focus on my other strengths. Well, you've probably never tried to learn. You know, don't assume that you that you're you either got it or you don't. So right. uh so so try. <laughs> right? L learn and then and then put it to use. Excellent. Excellent advice. Well, uh, Paul, thank you so much for spending time with us today and, and sharing your wisdom on this subject. And uh, we'll include all the, the links in our show notes so that folks can take advantage of, of the great books that you've put together. Already. Well, you're, you're very welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. Thanks so much. This podcast was brought to you by Bigger Brains, online training that won't bore you to tears. Expand the minds of your workforce at getbiggerbrains.com. Thanks for tuning in to Permission to Speak. If you want to increase collaboration and innovation in your organization, check out more resources available at speakingpractically.com or give me a call, Kelly Vandiver, at 770-597-1108.